Hi, uh, I am Anshul Makkar, uh, working as a software engineer at ORI. Um, I'm open source collaborator at Open Research Institute and my collaboration areas result, uh, um, relate to implementation of our LDPC on hardware. Uh, it's not the complete implementation of all the modules of LTPC. I have, I have uh, contributed to GSE encoder, uh, BB frame formation, and few more modules of LTPC implementation. Uh, apart from that, uh, I have also been contributing to debris research. Uh, again, as part of ORI, we just a couple of days back, we presented our paper to FCC. And um, my another uh, collaboration uh, relates to a dy dynamic scheduler. Uh, for again for a spacecraft which allows a spacecraft to to switch the task dynamically at runtime um, so if it's performing task x and if at ground station it's realized that uh, it needs to do task y suppose it's taking uh, it's doing altitude control and um, and it's need it needs to immediately switch some to some other task then that's possible with my dynamic scheduler. So that's my another contribution. Uh, today, uh, I'll be, uh, today my, the topic of my presentation is uh, coding theory, uh, why we need it, and, or basically what its application in space, uh, what at ORI, uh, how we have implemented uh, LDPC, which is a form of uh, forward error correction code, uh, how we have implemented uh, this at ORI uh, in FPGA. So uh, it's uh, coding theory, uh, I will start with, uh, as I mentioned, uh, why we need codes, then simple codes, then uh, going further deep, what are LDPC, that's a particular, particular class of codes that we have implemented and approach that we have used for its implementation. Uh, the coding theory uh, or uh, encoding a message using LDPC in codes uh, involves huge calculations. So, uh, we have to efficiently implement it. And so here I'll be focusing on uh, how we have implemented, how at ORI we have implemented this. Uh, you would appreciate that uh, this in itself, each of this is in itself a big topic. Uh, there are various research papers uh, uh, put forward for each of these topics. Uh, so in 30 minutes, it won't, be it won't be possible for me to go into depth of each of the topic. So my uh, aim here is to get uh, to uh, get you interested or to give you some pointers or to give you some basic understanding of how we can use uh, these codes or why these codes uh, are needed for long distance uh, communication, how they will how they are beneficial uh, and how they can be efficiently implemented in FPGA. So starting with, uh, first of all, why we need it. Uh, the, the communication link between uh, satellite or long distance communication link, you talk of Leo to Earth or Geo to Earth, any communication link, it's expensive, uh, limited in bandwidth, and also error prone. So we have three criteria: error, expense, expensive, and error, expensive, and limited bandwidth. So all these factors asks for efficient utilization. And that's where the answer comes from codes. So in, in a normal scenario, um, we send a message through a noisy channel, it gets corrupted uh, and the receiver, uh, we expect that it to detect the error and then convey the message back to the transmitter and transmitter resends the message. And that's how it happens in TCP IP communication. Uh, but here things are different due to these three factors. So here, we, we expect that uh, receiver should be able to uh, detect error and uh, 
also it should be able to correct us. Uh, first, focusing on detection part. Uh, we have initially, we had some class, uh, we have this error de de detection mechanism via CRC. So we have code bits C1, C2, CN. Uh, we do some calculation here. And based on the result, we insert that calculation result here. And let's, and we, we have this CRC bits here. So this is transmitted. Receiver receives the bits again calculates the CRC and finds out if there is corrupted bits or not. Easy, but there is again, it will convey the message, but there is no way that, but, but the only solution now is the transmitter has to send the message again, which is again a wastage of the channel. So what we want is that receiver is able to detect and correct error. And that's where the forward error, forward error correction codes come into picture. So they control the message before it has been transmitted by means of introducing some redundancy. So putting forward in another way, with FEC or forward error correcting codes, they allow us to introduce some redundant bits that allows receiver not only to detect, but also correct errors. Now, starting with the simplest form, and simplest form, simple error correction, we say, if we are transmitting an ASCII text, which is of seven bits, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. We add an extra bit here so that the sum of all the bits is zero. Sum here means XOR. So C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. Simple error, error detection. You send the bit seven bits, add an extra bit, and the result should be zero. Receiver receives the message, checks if, there is, if the result is not zero, there is an error. Again, it detects an error, but the correction part is still missing. Now, to To introduce the uh, correction part with, with this simplistic equation, it's clear that receiver will only be able to detect there, but not correct. So we have to make the equations a bit more complex so that we can also build in the capability of correction. Now, here comes the concept of parity check equations. Now, say, <laughs> And even uh, before moving to parity check equations, I want to give you another example just to make you understand uh, the scale of the problem. So suppose we have uh, 101 and we introduced, like in previous case, we, uh, uh, introduced one bit extra. Now here, let's repeat the complete message in itself. So 101, 101, instead of 101, or let's say uh, to make things clear, 110, 110, 110, we transmit 110, or another form of redundancy can be 111100, each bit is replicated. So this is a simplistic form of uh, error correction and error detection and correction that can be done at the receiver end, receiver's end. So receiver receives this message. And suppose
if this bits get flipped, then it has this, which is the correct one. Similarly, if this bits get flipped to zero, or this bits get flipped to zero, then it has this redundant bit to fall back upon. Uh, I don't think so you are able to see this one. So what I'm saying is that other form of redundancy can be like this. So we have one, one, each bit is replicated. So if this bits get corrupted, then it has this bit. If this bits get corrected, it has this bit. And yeah, similarly, um, it can find out here. If none is corrupted, then it can take one of the form. Again, a simplistic form uh, where you are duplicating the message uh, or duplicating the bits uh, so that if one gets corrupted, then at least receiver has another bit that is correct. But again, what happens if both the, get, both the bits get corrupted? That's, that's furthermore harder. A receiver will think that uh, if this both gets uh, flipped to one, one, the receiver will think that the one was transferred. Again, it's next process of evolution. Uh, so now we have um, for more complex equations or parity check equations. So if the message bits are one, one, zero, then let's say C, we have C1, C2, C3. So we say that we introduce redundant bits in such a way that they satisfy this equation. C4 is equal to C1 XOR C2. C5 is equal to C2 plus C3. And C6, it's not visible. C6 is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. Or we can say C1 plus C2 plus C4 is equal to zero. C2 plus C3 plus C5 equal to zero. And C1 plus C2 plus C3 plus C6 is equal to zero. So with this code word, so with this message bits, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, what we have, the encoded message will be in the form of C4 is C1 plus C2, which is zero. C5 is C2 plus C3, which is one. And C6 is equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3, which is again zero. So now for information uh, one, one, zero, we have the codified message or the encoded message as one, one, zero, zero, one, zero. With these equations, with these true uh, or check equations. Now, if some, if, if suppose this bits, if this bit get corrupt, corrupted or flipped to zero, then we have, then it will violate uh, these equations, we have C1 plus C2 plus C4. This is C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. So, so we have this C1 plus C2, C1 plus C2 plus C4. This will be now one, which will indicate to the receiver that there is an error. Similarly, C2 plus C3 plus C5. C2 plus C3 plus C1, C2 plus C3 plus C5. It will be again one, which again uh, will help the receiver to detect an error. And now it has two equations to detect error and correct it. But correction again require more equations, more parity check equations to correct errors.
So, as you would appreciate, uh, as you can see, as we are, equations are becoming a bit complex, but the probability of error detection and correction is better as compared to when we were doing simple redundancy. And Gallagher and McKay and other researchers have shown that with a limited amount of redundancy introduced along with message bits, it's still possible to achieve the channel limits for a channel. And this is, this is the basic fundamental principle uh, that's utilized for LTPC. Before moving to LTPC, uh, I want to show that these equations can also be represented in a matrix form. And it's in this form that we basically uh, uh, do, uh, we basically represent it in the hardware and do all the calculations. So given this, so I will rub these equations. And uh, we have this code word, and this is the message. This is the original message. And this is the code word. So this can also be represented as matrix multiplication of message vector, message vector of K bits along with identity matrix, which we call as H. And the identity matrix will be in the form of 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. This is H and length N. So for message bits, uh, let's call it K bit. So we have two, there are total possible of two raised to power K uh, message combinations, which will result in two raised to power N code words. And this two raised to power N code words will be a subset of the combinations of, uh, it will result in two raised to power K code words uh, which will be a subset of two raised to power n. And we can say that each code word, so each code word can be represented as u dot h, which is a multiplication of message bits or message vector along with h metrics. Now, the next question is how to find that. So we'll come to that because that plays a very important role. And this matrix will, with this matrix multiplication, this vector matrix multiplication will give us the same parity check equations that we studied in the previous few minutes back, yeah. Now, this will also form the basis for LDPC. LDPC encoding, because LDPC encoding is also a type of uh, it's it's a type of encoding. Uh, by doing matrix multiplication of this vector, message vector and uh, H matrix. But the only condition on H is that H should be sparse. And what a sparse means is that a uh, number of ones uh, should be less. Uh, and this is to make, this is to ensure that computational capacity, uh, computational complexity while, uh, calcul while encoding the message is less. But there are a few more constraints which I will go through why when I am at uh, LDPC. Uh, 
And another thing that I want to mention here is that uh, uh, the codes that are given by this product are symmetric code. Uh, and what a symmetric means is that the initial initial three bits or initial k bits of the code words are same as the message bits. So that's why this is a symmetric code. And to get a symmetric code, uh, we need to have this identity matrix. Then only the product will give us a code in this form. So now coming to uh, uh, LDPC. So as I mentioned, LDPC is again, uh, it's, it's, it's a symmetric code. Again, represented in form of uh, uh, code word is equal to UH, but there are some special constraints placed on the H or the identity matrix. And what are these constraints? Uh, it says that each row contains a fixed number of K number of uh, ones, which is called uh, uh, row constraint or row weight. Similarly, each column contains J number of, or again, a fixed number of ones, which is called uh, column constraint or column weight. And the number of ones common to any two rows is zero and one. Now, why these factors are important? Um, first of all, fixed number of rows, row weight, fixed number of row weight and column weight ensures that the complexity is less. And the constraint that says that the number of ones common to any rows is zero and one, it prevents cycles. Now, um, if you go, uh, uh, if if you dig uh, deep into this topic, uh, you will you will see how cycles are harmful for uh, this uh, uh, encoding, and how we can avoid that. Um, and you will study into Tanner graph that will that can clearly shows cycles. But yeah, I'm not top, uh, touching that topic here again. So, uh, how to form this parity check matrix again? Various researchers have shown their different approaches. Uh, like Mekke has shown that you start with uh, all zero metrics and then introduce ones at random places, but introduce ones in, ones, one in, uh, ones in, in such a way that uh, all these constraints are satisfied. Similarly, Gallagher showed another way of parity check, uh, how, how you can form your parity check matrix. Now, coming to, uh, how at ORI we have implemented LDPC. Uh, LDPC implementation was part of our uh, DVBS2 protocol implementation. DVBS2 protocol specifies that LDPC uh, specifies LDPC as one of the encoding mechanism, which you can use to codify your message bits once they are transmitted for transmitter and we were working on transmitter. So LDPC, we implemented LDPC. So, uh, the, the implementation of LDPC uh, uh, it has to be uh, it has to be efficient because uh, continuously messages are coming from the source and how it's forming we have this source uh, it does some encryption then we it goes to encoding uh, here we have LDPC then we have uh, then it goes here, then it follows the reverse form of decoding. Decryption and again, the message bits. So there is continuous stream of this message coming to our box, which is doing, which is encoder. So the way, uh, and in this case, we don't have to form parity check metrics because parity checks metrics or its positioning where the number of, where the ones should be there in that matrix is provided by DVBS2 protocol and extra B and C. So we store that table, that parity checks table or parity checks metrics in BRAM. So we have this BRAM where we have parity check. where we have parity check metrics. So this is the BRAM. So we have continuous stream of axis stream of message 
bits. So we get that message bits. We divide this table uh, or RAM into frames. So we don't fetch the complete RAM at one time. We get only a frame of uh, a, a RAM frame. Let's call it a RAM frame, which is a part of the complete matrix. Uh, we get only a, a RAM frame, whatever is needed at that moment to, to do the uh, equation or to, to do the calculation or to the computation. So we have message bits. We get frame RAM from here. We do calculation here and then it's outputted to the next step or next unit. So here we, we, we follow a, a parallel pipelining architecture where this is coming par, uh, parallelly, this is coming parallelly, then do the calculation, forward it, again, next step here, here, and forward it. So that's how uh, we implement uh, our, um, uh, we do the implementation in FPJ, and I have the, uh, numbers for uh, BA, BRAM utilization, LUT utilization, uh, which I can share. So that's all for my presentation. Uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, thanks for listening. Thank you.